Hey listeners, and welcome to the Lunar New Year release of 2021. This is Alex, your host of EOA Entrepreneurs of Asia. Today's episode was recorded a few months back with my good friend Zhang Gan Li, founder of Momentum Works. Momentum Works started as a venture accelerator and eventually picked up multiple revenue streams from consulting to venture building, running a very popular blog from China to Southeast Asia. This episode covers Zhang Gan's background and many of his views from education in China and Singapore, the effects of communism on entrepreneurship in China, his early start in journalism and how that served him as an entrepreneur later on when he joined Rocket Internet. We also cover business school, the current state of rideshare, what it takes to succeed in China, founding Momentum Works, going wide versus going deep as a founder, and much, much more. Just like Zhang Gan's career, we will go very wide here and discuss many topics of interest that are impactful for the Asia region. Let's dive right in. Welcome to the show. Thank you for your time today. Hi. Today with us, we have Zhang Gan Li. Uh, you can follow him on the Twitter at J I A N. Jan G G A N, right? I've not seen a namesake in my life, so I haven't found anyone who has the yes. same name. Yes, yes, you have a very unique name, which is something I'll ask you about later. So, Jan Gan yeah. is the CEO of Momentum Works. Uh, Jan Gan, in one concise sentence, what is Momentum Works? It's a venture outfit which uh, does a bit of everything in the in the ecosystem, from building to consulting to writing. Yeah, and I guess uh, some of the so so a venture builder. It does some content and it also does some consulting, uh, some corporate work. And under under the venture builders, you had companies like Pasar Pinjam, right? Which I think yep. you ex exited already. Yep, I'm quite right. lucky. So that was right. your first first yes. exit. Uh, Halal Node, which I, I don't know, is that still ongoing or? No, we had to shut it down. It was uh, too ambitious. Things fell, yeah. Yeah, and I think the one of the more famous things about Momentum Works is the media side, which is the blog you guys run, which is called the Lowdown, right? Uh, yes, and uh, and in fact, uh, something interesting is that we also have a blog on WeChat in Chinese, and uh, that is actually more popular compared to the Lowdown. I think it's uh, way also oh, like it's not considered under the Lowdown. It's definitely has a bigger audience and a bigger community, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the last time you guys did some type of YouTube view, you had over 50,000 like live people watching, right? 80,000, yeah. 80,000, oh, that's crazy. Um, most yeah. people in China, yeah. Uh, previously, before this, you had positions as an EIR at ANSIAD. You were an adjunct faculty at Singapore Management University. Okay. Briefly, uh, managing director at Food Panda. And uh, how we got to know each other is we were both working at Easy Taxi mm -hmm. back uh, from 2013 and then your very first start in your career was Alphabet Media, right? Which was a small company when I joined, a bigger company when I left. And uh, I'm not sure what they're still there. So before we begin though, something about your name. What, what exactly does your name mean and how do you pronounce it? Jiang Gan, uh, in Mandarin, uh, different, I mean, pronounced different in, in my dialect, which is, um, uh, which is the tongue of a, of, a, of a small town near Shanghai. And it's, uh, it's, it's kind of transitional between between Mandarin and uh, and Shanghainese, which um, which w whenever I was, I mean, when I first came to Singapore, when I was uh, speaking uh, to my parents on the phone, and people pe people next to me were always thinking that I was speaking Japanese, but uh, apparently <laughs> that was the case. Um, okay. Yeah. So I was born near. Um, my mom was working in a hospital, um, right on a bank of Yangtze. So, so 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 Jiang means which literally means like a big river. So and and Gan is something, something to do with jade. So basically, some some kind of jade, like a jade river. Yeah, no jade next to river, jade in the river, jade in the river. And I guess uh, I don't know, jade. Jade is highly prized, right? And I guess rivers have a lot of meaning, so it's a pretty good name. So um, as, as I said, I've never seen a seen a namesake in my life, uh, which uh, um, which is interesting because uh, because I don't have to sort of. I mean, whenever people look at my name, they, they sort of remember, hey, this is unique, but they always have a part of problem pronouncing because because um, it's spelled out, it's a bit different. Um, there, there's a, there's a district in, in the city of Hanzhou where Alibaba is, uh, which has the same so, sort of, it's a district called Jiangan, but, uh, oh, yeah. but, but in Chinese it's, um, um, it's written differently, but, but of course we transcribe that into, into, into pinyin, it, it looks the same. Mm. Mm. Okay. So tell me, how would your friends describe you now? Uh, interesting question. Um. I think I think one description that 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 I heard uh, uh, a few times is um, tangential. 
What does that mean? Always going off a tangent. Oh, uh, tangent. Oh, tangential. Okay, so always coming off on a tangent. Okay. Yeah, that's a tough question. So, um, yeah, I think at, at, at different stages of life, um, there's this bit of difference, and, and, and sort of you hang out with the with different groups of people. Um, but at this stage, I guess I guess many people are saying that oh, um, I like to network. I've, know lots of people and um, I can always pull people together very easily um, but which is actually really against my nature um, Not really I, I did a personality to the test uh, I'm def definitely introvert oh well no in so introverts I feel can connect with people um, in, in different ways that extroverts maybe are, are not wired to and I think that's I mean, I wouldn't say just because you're introvert doesn't mean you can't connect uh, to many people on, on, on a maybe deeper level and build different types of relationships, right? Yep, yep, yep. And, um, uh, I, and my colleagues say that uh, I'm too serious. Really? They say you're too serious. Well, I guess because they, they know you um, from a work setting and, and there's a lot of on your plate to juggle. Uh, but like, I, I think I've known you since 2013. So it's only like, what, seven, seven years plus. And I, I definitely see more aspects to, to the, other than the serious side, you know, you could also be quite, quite the jokester, right. <laughs> uh, and, uh, very friendly when, when, you know, and, and a, and a good friend overall, mm -hmm. um, how, how has being tangential served you then? I suppose, I mean, I, I, I don't do much of that now, but, uh, but I think when Wikipedia first came out, I mean, one of my favorite activities was just going through Wikipedia, clicking links, and uh, always ending up spending like, I don't know, four or five hours on that when I was free and over the weekend. Um, initially, it was just just pure interest, right? You like to read a lot and you, you, you and on different subjects and talk to, lots, to, to, to a lot of people. Um, but as you grow older, I uh, just feel that things which are seemingly disconnected with very weak links, with jumping from one thing to another, mm. then to another again. Um, after I realized that that the way we try to think to solve a problem, things just click, right? I mean, just find links between things. And uh, yeah. um, just to give you an example, which might be a bit lame. Once I was, uh, I was, I was at the supermarket and uh, the trolley bag was empty. Um, so, 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 so my wife, uh, so went to ask the, 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 the shop assistant where to find a trolley. And at the same time, I just went straight to the, to the parking lot and, uh, because, because <laughs> I put my mind, okay, I mean, the trolleys are not here. They must be at another place because, because in Singapore, you have to like put a coin when you put, mm. put a trolley. So, so, so the purpose of that is to. To, for you to put things in order, so things must be order, in order. Things must be at another place. So, so, yeah. so lots of things um, came this way, and uh, um, I think the positive side is that uh, whenever you try to look for a specific piece of information, because you see, you see the linkage, you, you can easily find something adjacent, and 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 through that, uh, lead to whatever you're trying to find. Um, uh, the, the downside is that sometimes it's just uh, it just it's just too much activity in your, in your brain. Yeah. I mean, definitely it serves you as a founder, as an entrepreneur going wide, mm -hmm. right? Often like early stage in building ventures, you have to be a generalist and, you know, you have to know enough to talk on the same level as experts to keep up with them. And, and, and sometimes even know as much as them, but, you know, it has to be across many disciplines to get people together to, to be a good leader for, for that kind of type of venture. Right. So I think, I think in a sense, you know, it helped you. Yeah. I think, I think that point is actually quite important. Um, um, my first job, um, I studied as a journalist, so so I was uh, covering a specific trade, and, and part of that was to do something to do with the hospitals using IT systems. So I, I think because I studied in a sort of engineering university, so that served me well because I sort of understood the systems. But um, but being able to to be seen as part of them by all those like hospital CIOs and stuff um, made it much easier for you to learn um, that's a that's a that's a very good point so actually in a sense like having some type of journalistic background or instinct will definitely serve you as a founder and entrepreneur as well oh it does it does i mean it, it makes you sort of naturally curious and and uh, and mm. it to find information and try to make linkage between different pieces of information um definitely helps um i, I don't know how to quantify that but uh, but definitely i mean sometimes when it comes to problem solving um at least at least you are able to sort of see different things and come out with different possible solutions. But whether you can actually solve the problem, that, that that's the execution issue, which, which is separate. Yeah. 
Uh, ex execution, of course, is a different thing. And uh, mm -hmm. I would like to point out, you know, uh, Jason Calacanis, the, the famous angel investor in Silicon Valley, his background is also in journalism too, I think, uh, and media, right? So mm -hmm. I definitely think there's an overlap that that's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to go back now to, um, so I have a handful of friends that I'm probably going to talk to. And so the first person I talked to was Amy Chan. She's mm. from Shanghai is, uh, originally. Mm. Uh, and she told us about her time in communist China. So I don't think she has a monopoly on this. I think you have your own stories too, right? So mm. you also grew up in communist China. Is that correct? Um, I grew up in China, which was run by the Communist Party. Are you okay to reveal your age or are we staying away from that? So, um, okay. I mean, maybe a more sensitive time, like 1989, uh, when I was six. Yeah. And that, that was when the thing happened in Beijing, right? The, the, the Tiananmen Square incident. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So that, that was a time, um, I was about to enter primary school and I remember there's like every day, there's like gruesome images on TV and stuff. Um, parents got really worried and they said the things might be coming or whatever. And, and then, then like, a, a year, I think a year after then you see the, uh, yeah. the Soviet Union being dissolved and, uh, and it just, just, just huge area of uncertainty uh i mean before that uh, i know that there was a there, there was there was an age like in the 1980s where people looked for liberal values and stuff um but um but early 1990s there was a sense of i do remember when i was a kid i mean there was a sense of anxiety across the society and and things were, were starting to undergo rapid changes um yeah and i mean that was definitely rooted in I guess, in a sense, the the Cultural Revolution happened in the eighties, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of that, that went far, far out, right? That went far out, and then I think you know, I guess the time you're talking about was the transfer of uh, I don't know how to pronounce the name, Deng Xiaoping, right? right? And then I I think that's before I guess China cracked open and 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 joined World Trade and and thing, things started to boom, right? Yep. Um, um, the WTO definitely, definitely a major game changer. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my hometown, you see factories been built at a very very rapid speed and uh, you see people getting rich and people start buying cars mm. um yeah i think everything happened after, after i think it was still 2001 2002 after china joined the wtu and uh, everything happened very very fast mm -hmm. and what were, i mean mm. we're so at least uh, when i talked to amy she was talking about hardships of having like, you know, the, you are allotted food coupons. And then of course she, she would like hoard them for herself. Like were, were there hardships that you saw or was your family just lucky to be better well off? Or what was that like? Uh, where's uh, her family from? Which, which part of Shanghai, I'm not too sure. P pretty much Shanghai somewhere in Shanghai. I mean, that's pretty broad and big. Uh -oh. So uh, uh, yeah. yeah that, that, that. Um, I, I don't remember things being particularly hard. Um, but but probably I mean parents would have different concerns yeah. right I mean yeah. my, my my mom always told me that when she was young I mean 1950s 1960s it was it was much much harder mm -hmm. and uh, and after the Cultural Revolution generally things were on on a, on a positive trajectory so 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 every like two or three years they can feel that visibly is better yeah. than two or three years before I mean in terms of um, at least a material material wealth mm -hmm. and um, and and. And she was telling me that, I mean, all these people complaining about, like, you know, things being hard in the 1990s, and then nothing <laughs> seen things in like 1950s and early 1960s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, definitely different time but, periods. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that, I mean, I, I think that happens to me and also happens to lots of uh, sort of um, friends working as entrepreneurs uh, in China and outside China, but from China, is the people of my generation who, who grew up at least until high school and left after sort of for university, etc. <laughs> So, um, so their sense is that, uh, I mean, when they were a kid, so they look at uh, the, the education in primary school, everything was nice, you know, communism was nice, mm. even though that was not practicing communism. Yeah. Um, and afterwards, afterwards, I mean, when, when, when you go to high school, when, when, when you start receiving information from the outside, you started doubting everything. You thought everything was a lie. Oh, wow. Okay. And the world was not as rosy, especially in the late 1990s and early 2000s, there was lots of corruption. So, so you see things which are not as nice as, uh, as, as they de depict in, in sort of primary or high school, um, textbooks. Um, but as you grow older, I mean, especially when you start running companies, you start to appreciate, um, things that, uh, that, I mean, as the, as the leader of the country, right. I mean, where the small stone was then shopping, mm -hmm. they had to balance. I mean, it's not, it's not that, okay, you pursue a, a agenda that's morally right and things will work. Yeah. You have to balance lots of lots of different interests, lots of legacy, and 
and lots of people trying to pull you back. Interesting, this year during, during the pandemic, um, some of my entrepreneur friends in Beijing have all studied at the same time to read the works of, of Mao Zedong mm. and how he supplied the revolution yeah. and the idea of uh, creating like a strategic mm -hmm. depth in the countryside before surrounding the cities. Yeah. And how do you deal with like a much much uh, bigger and uh, and a well equipped uh, competitor? Mm -hmm. And this kind of things, I mean, they draw lots of like you know no 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 things that could like could learn. But I mean, it doesn't mean that things things were morally right. But uh, but but definitely, I mean, if you're in a position um, of creating a company, and versus I mean, and and in a hard situation versus. Uh, and then we are going against much bigger competitors. Mm. And so, it's, so there are lessons to be learned. I mean, it, it sounds almost very soft bank uh, philosophy. Uh, you can even draw mm. parallels to like uh, the, the US elections of what we just saw. Uh, you can, you mm. can even compare to, like, you know, the, like what, what you said about how difficult and how big China is uh, versus when mm. you look at, you know, Singapore and how small and how they made things efficient. It's just a completely different mm. problem set, you know, and sometimes you can draw parallels, sometimes you can't. Um, so definitely, mm -hmm. I think you're, you're right, you know, looking back to the history, it's a lot of those lessons can apply in terms of strategy and entrepreneurship, for sure. Yeah, but we look at people, I mean, your parents are, are originally from Vietnam, right? Yeah. I mean, if you, um, if, if you look at a history of people who left the country at different periods of time, and their memory about countries. Oh, very, very different. Yeah. And the perception about how the country is doing now is very different. Very different. And... It, that depends on how much what, of, of what they held on to in the past and, and those emotions yeah. and also yeah. uh, their, their current ties back home, you know, like uh, it's very interesting because yeah. a lot of my parents' friends would actually talk to me, uh, talk to my to my mm -hmm. parents and say, oh, why do you let your son stay in Asia? You know, we, we left there and what's he doing there? And uh, I think they don't realize yeah. that life is actually pretty good here. So, yeah. so, so, so what were you like as a child then? Like, um, who was Zhang Gan and was, you know, is he different from you now or is he pretty much the same? My dad um worked in, in a school and um and i think at some point of time he had to volunteer to teach my class because i was creating lots of trouble in the class like you know yeah pointing out see. mistakes by the teachers <laughs> and uh, and uh, and playing with the kids who, who had the but lowest grade and they said you are in terms of like academic performance rank number two or number three um in the whole promotion and they should not spend time with those guys who are at the bottom. So, so definitely not very obedient. And I think the worst record I had was, uh, I was summoned by the director of discipline of the school six times. Six times. Okay. In, in a single day. In a day. Oh my God. What were you doing? In a day, yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I don't know. I mean, just not showing up at the morning exercise, um, cutting a queue at the school canteen. You know, making too much noise after the 10 p.m. In, in, a, in a dorm. Ah, so you lived in a dorm. Okay. And when, when I was in high school, yeah, I was living in a dorm. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you had a rebel streak early on. I mean, it almost sounds like you were meant for entrepreneurship and you just didn't conform and listen to what people were telling you. Yeah, kind of, yeah. And, but, but at the same time, you were also good at school. Um, it, it sounds like it was quite easy for you or did you have to work hard? Like what was, like, because people always talk about China, Korea, Japan. Uh, nations where academic pressure for young people are are massive, right? Did, did you feel this kind of pressure for competition, especially in like a really highly competitive nation like China? When I look at my sort of cousins, uh, nephews, niece who are much younger than me, and I definitely feel that they had lots of lots of pressure. But uh, but in nineteen nineties, when I was when I was doing school, um, I sort of feel that the pressure was not that high, mm. and um, and and also. Probably because my dad was working at the school, so so I had pretty good ex uh, exposure. So I do remember, I mean, a few times during the weekends, I was just hanging out with the school uh, library. So so he was showing me the books and uh, and taught me stuff, and and lots of these things came sort of naturally. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have like work very hard towards that. So that made lots of things easier for me. I would say that I was a little bit privileged in that particular school. So that made my life e a bit easier, but uh, but I, I certainly did see people who were working much, much harder than I was, um, but um, but probably achieving the same or even less. So that in a way sort of changed my perspective about, I mean, working hard versus sort of- Working smart. Working smart or sort of channeling your energy towards the right places. Mm, prioritizing correctly. And that's, a, that's an interesting lesson early on. Um, mm. Do do you think like modern pressures that your nieces and nephews face now is is it tied to the growth of wealth or where where is this new pressure coming from in in the modern sense? 
I think a lot of pressure came from the parents. So from being wealthy, because, right? Or not having the opportunity or? No, I mean, the the competition amongst the parents. Mm. I mean, of course, I mean, so so back in 1990s, everybody was sort of more or less equal. I mean, some people are slightly more sort of privileged because they held to civil service positions or whatever. Um, but in terms of material wealth, people are more or less equal. And now it's vastly different. And uh, and that creates competitive pressure. I mean, you think about when they organize um, sort of school outings, and then when parents came, of course, they came with different cars yeah. and different kinds of wealth. <laughs> and, and, and and you know that in, in, in a sort of East Asian setting, it's competitive. So so that creates pressure. And, uh, and parents want their kids to be competitive. So I remember w when I was growing up, I mean, the school would end at 6.40 p.m. And, and in primary school, mm. but, but you didn't have to work afterwards. Okay. But nowadays, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine a kid not having to work after 6.40 p.m. Wow, okay, De definitely mm. different lives. And mm -hmm. I guess even in Singapore, you still see that element too. Do you, do you know any um, friends of yours in Singapore of children? Do, do they face the same pressures? Uh, they do. Um, they feel that there's lots of pressure, but uh, but I think it's definitely more competitive in China. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, you did really well at school and you ended up getting a full scholarship to go to university in Singapore from the Singapore government, right? Mm -hmm. um, how, you know, was it because you just did really well? And I guess back then Singapore was very open to accepting more foreign talent or how, how did you get the scholarship? I think there were a number of programs that Singapore had with China and also a few other countries where they offer scholarship for people at different stages of studies to, to come to Singapore. So, um, so I, I, I don't know how that worked, but, uh, but that particular year, the, the school came to, I mean, I think, I think the Ministry of Education of Singapore came to our municipality saying that, Hey, um, select a few top schools, I can mm -hmm. recommend a few people and go through a test. If they are keen, they can. They can come to Singapore to to to, to study. Uh, all all expenses covered, but they have the obligation to work in Singapore for a number of years afterwards. Um, um. So so me and a few friends we went for the test, and uh, some of us passed, and um, and I think most of us decided to take it. Um, um. Th there are like one or two who decided not to take it because they said, okay, Singapore is too far away. It's a very small place. And do I really want to commit a number of years there? Mm. And because at that time it was not as impressive as mm. it is today. Mm. True. And then you you chose to do computer engineering at uh, Nanyang Technology University. Yeah, the pure reason was that I mean I think um, so the scholarship came with the uh, strings attached. So ah, you, okay. And uh, that that's that's available if you study uh, science or, or engineering courses. Okay. So um, so the reason why I went for computer engineering was. Um, uh, funny um uh, it was not well thought after and it was um as most young people yeah so when we first came to singapore you would have um um I think, I think a bit more than a year of courses in english and also the science um the science disciplines and um i think at that time i really really hated uh, uh our professor of chemistry and mm. uh I, I just didn't i didn't have any chemistry with that guy so <laughs> so <laughs> nice one so, so when I was picking which um, uh, which measure to go for, for university, and um, um, you know, at that time, I mean, Singapore sort of mandated all engineering students to to go through this like a year course of common engineering. Yeah. And uh, computer engineering was the only course that you didn't have to go through this. And uh, I said, okay, this is the only course that I don't okay. have. To I don't have to study a year of chemistry, so that's why I picked that. So it's more more of a young person's kind of choice. And did you end up hating it or loving it, or what was that like? I mean, there were aspects I liked. I mean, the coding part I actually liked liked doing. And uh, I mean, we we, we started like you know, writing the codes and uh, and compiling that, and then things get rendered. Um, that's kind of fun because you feel that you are creating something. Yeah. Um, I didn't like some of the professors. Uh, I specifically remember one episode where I went to a class and I was asking a question, and the professor said that this is beyond the scope of this course. <laughs> that's it. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's uh, not a good response. Uh, I, I just felt it was a bit too too limiting. That's how you kill curiosity in a young person, right? Yep, 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 yep. I mean, you 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 could try to answer that. Then they add add a note saying that. By the way, you don't have to worry about that mm -hmm. because I I think most people care too much about exams in, in university. 
But that's um, very that's very much a Singapore thing, right? I, I don't know. I mean, so I, I understand when you, when you care about sort of exams in high school, but the university, I mean, the results really don't matter. Yeah. That much, as much. Uh, at university, you're saying, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it's true. I mean, it really depends, though. Uh, so if your if your degree requires foundational knowledge, where like your industry needs you to get a master's and a PhD, then then they kind of matter in that sense. Like say economics, mm -hmm. if you want to be at the top of like the Federal Reserve or a bank or something, right? Like you kind of need it, but it's especially engineering or being a doctor. But other than that, I would have to in general agree with you that you know it's not not so uh, important at that stage. Um, mm -hmm. So why why didn't you end up pursuing it? Why why drop computer engineering after graduation? Yeah, I remember that that clause um, in the in the sort of scholarship contract that you are supposed to work in Singapore afterwards. Yeah, and. Um, I think many of my classmates wanted to work in banks, but um, but but the problem at that time in banks in Singapore, and I'm not I'm not sure whether it's still the case now, is that you really didn't have any position where you create stuff. It's, it's basically most of most of them working in sort of kind of maintenance jobs. As an IT you person, basically. As an IT person, not as an engineer, yeah. and I didn't know that um, until I, I went to Paris for an exchange when I was in the third year of university. And uh, I remember I had a long discussion with one professor there, and uh, he was basically telling me that as an engineer, you're supposed to create things. Yeah. <laughs> so you didn't know that. You didn't realize what your degree and the impact. Um... Yeah, I mean, you're supposed to, to build things. Yeah. And things that you are not supposed to be there to, to maintain a system, and that's what a technician does. That's not what an engineer does. So what do, what do you think people should be pursuing these days uh, in terms of education? Should they be going to school? Should they not be bothering? Uh, what, what's possible, do you think? I think when I was, um, I think going for exchange was definitely a good thing. I picked that, uh, I picked that school in Paris for, for exchange because, um, because I, I mean, read a lot about Paris and, um, and sort of um, wanted to sort of experience that. What I didn't know is that I ended up in, in a fairly small school where they had only, I think at that time, like 15 or 16 international students. Mm. What was, it, what was the name of the school? It's called Efre. Yeah. So it's uh, in, in the suburbs of uh, Paris called the Village Reef, the Jewish town. Um, and um, and it, was, um, it was small, like 1,200 people and uh, very few international students. Um, which initially was tough because uh, I think most of the courses, aside from one class called European Union, all the other classes were conducted in French and uh, that was tough. Um, I had friends who went to sort of different parts of Europe. Uh, they went to bigger universities where they had lots of like international students and they had very, very good cultural exchange and stuff. And for me, it was, um, it was, uh, it was a bit tough in the beginning because you I mean, you go to class, you don't understand anything. <laughs> oh, oh, I mean, some people didn't really go to the class, but uh, but but I mean, at least you hope to have that kind of experience. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but after a few months, you realize it was actually cool because once you start understanding what's going on, you start you start hanging out with people who you previously couldn't have a conversation because at that time, I mean, the uh, the young French didn't really speak good English. Yeah. And now, so so yeah, it was good exposure, and um, I think now now especially. The universities in Singapore start to mandate, I mean, not mandate, but encourage people to, to go out to different places. Mm. Uh, and, and, and that, I think, is a very, very cool thing. During my time, so, sort, of, sort of, most people would go to Canada, mm -hmm. would go to Sweden, would go to the UK, and a few would go to like obscure places like France or, or Denmark. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody would go to Indonesia. So, but but now it's much more diverse. I mean, we have people going to Korea, people going to Poland, people going to like smaller cities in China, and uh, and and that that gives people different exposure to see that the, the world the world can be very different. So, and so I, as essentially, are you saying then that that you still think there's a really good value prop proposition for the current education system? I, I mean, the system is there, and um, and and it's almost like a game that you go through, and how 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 do you play it, and um, mm. And, and I mean, what types of scores that uh, that you will put emphasis on, and we come out I and mean, how do you differ from from like four years or three years uh, earlier when you went in? Now I think uh, uh, there's this debate like, okay, dropouts work out better than people who who was time in university, but um, but I just don't feel that uh, that argument is based on proper statistics. It was more sort of based on exceptions. Probably based on survivorship bias.
of what we consider yeah. successful, right? So, um, yep, 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 yep. how was your transition then from from China to Singapore? Was it a culture shock, or was it what you expected? Was it better? Uh, it was a culture shock, and a um, number of things. First, um, first in terms of food, and uh, the noodles here are very different from the noodles you would see in China. <laughs> how are they different? Um, I think back in my hometown next to Shanghai and uh, the noodles, I mean, would be similar to what you find um, in Japanese stores. So it's, it's white, it's, it's a bit smooth. Mm. Uh, and, and I think they put it in some alkaline water or something. So it has, uh, it has it's a different seat. texture. Yeah, yeah and, and, and different taste. It's just different. So, 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 so of course, it, uh, it took a while to, 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 to adapt to. And um, oh, yeah, I remember one thing I was particularly not used to. Uh, is is the quiet Lunar New Year? I think Singapore banned uh, fireworks. Ah, uh, okay. So the New Year's was very quiet. New Year was very quiet, quiet, and that was not something that I was used to. I mean, you, you're used to like playing with uh, firecrackers and stuff, and, and which I know it's not safe. It's not environmentally friendly, but when you were a kid, that, that was also fun. Yeah, I mean, I think you can come over to Malaysia. It's it's still very loud uh, for every single New Year from Hari Raya yeah. to Deepavali to to the Chinese I don't New think Year. It's in Malaysia, it's just uh, it's just how the law is enforced. Yeah, that that's true. Yeah, that that's true. Um, yeah. so so there was no, there was no really negative experience per se. Like you weren't treated being you know like a second class citizen because you're from China, or or did you have any bad experiences there? Um, I had like some bad experience. I had some bad experiences in France as well, and. Uh, um, but once you have seen a lot more and uh, most of the experience was positive, you tend to sort of forget the bad experience mm, unless cool. whatever you have is really, really bad. Yeah, traumatic. So that's, in general, it's just what you would expect from just shitty people probably, right? Yeah, that, that, I mean, you see bad people everywhere. I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, go back to China and see bad people I mean, just everywhere. And some people think I'm bad, so. <laughs> well, I guess that will depend on the context, right? Um, so yeah. so what, what does China do right that the rest of the world maybe gets wrong? Well, what do you mean? What do they? What do you think they do something better that people could learn from? You know, China. Yeah. Oh, a lot of things. Um, certain things can be learned. Certain things can't be learned. Um, so, for instance, cultural evolution. Is mm. it bad or is it good? Uh, of course, I mean, most people will say, "Oh, it's bad because it destroyed traditional culture." Um, but, 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 if you try to build a business in China, you will see that um, it actually swept lots of historical baggage away okay so you, you, feel, you feel that when, when people are trying to build uh enterprises in the 1980s they didn't have this cultural baggage and, uh, and when the government was trying to reform certain things they didn't have the the baggage of traditional value and if you look at the the young people in china now they're probably much more i don't know what's the right word to, to describe that liberated or sort of carefree whatever even compared to the well the i mean it's like it, it's it's like the youth in Vietnam right now, mm. right? They, they don't have a conception of what the war is, but it's not mm. because of a cultural revolution, right? It's just they were born in a different time period and things are much mm. more prosperous now. So mm. in a sense, you know, it's just more like um, starting off with a clean slate, I guess. Yeah, because before that, I mean, um, before the communist came, I mean, so, so I actually read quite a bit of history when I, when I first came to Singapore because in a school library, you would have books that you didn't have access to in China. So, so I actually spent lots of time reading there. Mm. It look back to see what lots of the things that the, that the communist government did and the previous government and the one which lost the civil war and tried to do something similar, but they just couldn't, just couldn't because there's so much resistance from, from people with existing interests to, mm -hmm. to maintain the system as status quo. I have the sense that, I mean, so the communists actually swept lots of things into the dustbin and uh, left a clean sheet for people to build on. and and. Things can be wild. I mean, some people are saying that people in China have lost faith because young people didn't really care about ancestors, what old people did a lot, mm. and they didn't really care about religion. Mm. And um, and things became a little oh. bit more pragmatic. Um, people care about money. Uh, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? I don't know, but it certainly allowed um, entrepreneurship to prosper. That, that's a very interesting point. Like. I mean, like, so if we're going to read in between the lines and trying to pull the lesson, mm. um, I mean, I don't think we're, we're advocating people start wiping out culture, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> no, but I mean, like what, what China did, I, yeah. I mean, it's like you said, we're not sure if it's right or wrong. That, that's a tough one to crack, but the result of what 
happened in you know communist china and then opening up you know uh, mm. china is a powerhouse now today they are mm. the, roughly the same size as the u.s economy mm. uh innovation is happening in its different flavor and i guess i guess you know if one were to want to take time to look at it they have to dissect that a little bit more to take the learnings but that's i guess that's, that's what you're pointing to right and also think about that i mean they swept all the previous land titles away and um and put all the land ownership to the state so afterwards when they try to create the infrastructure it became much easier and the, and the and the modern debate now for the for America US right everyone's talking about how will you unite the country and have a divide of two very different classes of people from the rural to the coastal elites mm. um, i mean again we're not we're not advocating for a cultural wipeout but mm. in, in a sense you have to come to a place where it could just everyone could reach the same level and then build on that right I, I do think there's a there's, there's a big divide uh, between coastal China and uh, and, and rural, rural China. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's going to be everywhere, right? It's, it's even everywhere. in Malaysia, except Singapore. Singapore is a city state, right? Uh, I think in Singapore you still feel that. I mean, um, so we go around uh, Orchard Road is very different from when you go around some of the sort of uh, sort of uh, government housing areas in the north and in the west. You still feel you know, it's, it's, it's a very good point. When I take taxis and mm. I ask them about their life in Singapore, mm. they, they tell me it's a struggle every single day, which is, you know, I go talk to my banker friends, man, everyone's, you know, having parties, going to yeah, KTV yeah, and blah, blah, blah. Right. So it's, the, you're, I think you're definitely right. That's still, there is still a class divide even there. Yeah, it is. It is. And, uh, and it's something that, uh, that the policymakers need to balance because the, because Singapore is still a democracy and, uh, you still need to make sure that, uh, I mean, the interest of the most people is taken care of because otherwise, um, otherwise you will become unstable. Definitely, definitely. And I think that's going to be the, the challenge for the future generations. How about Singapore? What what do they get right that the world could learn from? I think I think Lee Kuan Yew is definitely a great, great, great politician, and uh, and uh, and he focused on lots of things which were right. I, I do remember that uh, that that when I was in um, university, there was a course called Engineers and Society, mm -hmm. uh, which basically taught about the values of Singapore government and the principles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and remember, there's one word which was uh, repeated over and over. It is called pragmatism. Okay. So not bound by sort of ideology, not bound by um, sort of certain value, what is right or what is not right, but 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 doing things which are practical, which serve the purpose. I mean, think about that. I think Lee Kuan Yew said before that Singapore will never have a casino, but now Singapore has two casinos. Think about that. <laughs> yes. Well, they 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 also restrict locals from from using them, right? But they still have them. Yes, correct. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, 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 you know, like I think a lot of your personality, what I'm realizing, is is based in your context. Like it, that, what you said about Singapore, about pragmatism, mm -hmm. could equally apply apply to what happened post cultural revolution in China and opening up. Right, mm -hmm. it's about being more pragmatic and letting go of the ideology of the past for mm -hmm. to make way for for a future. And and I guess Singapore comes from the same place where their future was massively uncertain post World War II, right? Mm -hmm. And and they had to kind of navigate that and figure it out. And I guess that's their their manifesto in a sense when they're teaching these things uh, for the young. And um, and I think, you know, do, do you think that's influenced you and your personality and your thinking? I think definitely. Um, I'm, I might not be able to summarize that that, 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 that in a very concise way, but definitely there's a there's big impact. I mean, like for me as a friend personally, to me, that's where I, I could see it, I think, you know, and, and it helps me understand you as better as a person, I think, and, and hearing your story. So, but so let's, let's, let's fast forward. Let's, let's jump to your first experience then. Um, after NTU, you graduated and your first job for six years was in a company called Alphabet Media. I tried to do research. Um, interestingly enough, their domain goes to a gray market casino online betting website now. I think <laughs> the company shot in... 20, I don't know, 2014, 2015. Okay, so they shut down and someone took the domain. A few years after I left, I, I left in uh, 2012, um, after five and a half years, basically, yeah. And I was trying to read on LinkedIn what it was, but it seemed like it was a combination of like a, a think tank, a research, media, and what was what exactly was it? I started as a media company and uh, doing trade publications focused on government and, uh, and basically public sector. Okay. So, so, so so publications on how technology is adopted in public sector. And um, I joined a company, I was, was by chance. I was purely by chance. And so when I was back from, from Paris, I was, I was broke because you know, Paris was quite expensive for students. Yes. So who was, um, who was on free housing and the limited sort of allowance from Singapore, but in Paris you have to pay the rent and everything. And, uh, and also mm. the life in Paris. So it was quite expensive. So I was I was working quite a bit in my in my final year to pay off the the debts and um, what, what were you doing? Different things. I I, I did like credit control for a Singapore f f 
furniture manufacturer on the Southern European market for about three months. So basically calling people saying that, Hey, um, you have to pay. <laughs> Chasing credit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a good skill to have. Um, I, yeah, it was also funny that, that whenever I was saying that, okay, I was calling from Singapore and, uh, you see, most people didn't know where Singapore was. Uh, Interesting, really. We were calling like uh, like people, I mean, distributors and uh, and and, uh, and resellers in sort of small towns in France, in uh, okay. southern Spain, and southern Italy as well. Yeah, they didn't even realize where where the their stuff was coming from. I didn't and know they, and who they owed. Just didn't know where Singapore was. And uh, I was also working as a, as interpreter for conferences. Um, so so that 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 was paying pretty well for a university student. So. I did simultaneous uh, interpretation for, for a few conferences. Okay. Um, uh, that was interesting. And also French, Chinese, Eng English, French, English, Chinese. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so it was fun. And, um, and, and one of the conferences I, I, I bumped into the founder of this company and he just started, um, a guy from the UK who graduated from uh, Oxford with a, with a degree in history and uh, he was working sort of publishing. And, um, and, and he, he just started his own publication and uh, the mm -hmm. team sounded fun. And he said, we want to come and work and join us. So I had a, had a chat with a, with a few people in the team and that's how I ended up there. Yeah. And I think this is where you you start to develop your journalistics chops, right? You, yep, you start perfect. to focus in media publishing, uh, have to do journalistic work. Yeah. Um, and I feel like this was very quite pivotal because a lot of what I see in momentum works today mm. probably came from this experience, right? For the, at least the, the, the blog side, the publishing side, the media side. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I do see the influence of media, but, uh, but I also see the, uh, limitation of media. So, 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 so this is something maybe subconsciously I'm trying to balance, right? I mean, I've been trying to build that kind of influence, um, that kind of, that kind of sharing, that kind of community, but without, I mean, building a media business model, if you mm. what I, yeah. I see what you mean. And yeah. so what, what was, what was your main job back then? And what were some of the, the accomplishments? Or I mean, the it, was, like? it was a small company. So it was really a bit of everything. So I studied, I, I studied, um, on the content side. So planning the content, writing the content, speaking with people, interviewing people, traveling around, talking to people. And, and then of course, I mean, you sort of help the business side of, of the business at that time, it was a media business. So, so, so the revenue will come from sponsorship, advertising, as well as, um, um as well as commission research right so mm -hmm. um so so talking to clients so trying to sound smart trying to try, try yeah. to get into communities and um and also um and also at some point of time I was i think i was a bit bored of uh what board, board of stay in singapore so 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 sort of i sort of convinced the, the company to start a bureau in hong kong so i went there a lot that was fun and uh but of course hong kong was still still a small place so so went a bit ambitious went to beijing and i mean built a bureau and established relationships with, with, with the public sector as well as the ecosystem um and then i realized that uh, that i mean that was the first time of me working in china but working in china that was it was very different from what i imagined and um, mm. i almost felt that i couldn't communicate with people because if you are in singapore and hong kong for too long you tend to be very straightforward in, in the way you communicate. Okay. That was like, uh, like almost like Americans or, or how? I mean, just, uh, just, just, we talk to people, it's straightforward and you understand, I mean, you tell your concerns, you tell what you like. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, and when you went to Beijing, um, lots of things were cryptic. Interesting. People tell you things, but they don't really mean what they tell you. And, um, and, and, and but people who live in that cultural context would be able to understand, uh, understand. Um, I suppose, I suppose that's different from the tech companies now, but, uh, but okay. Beijing with the, because I was dealing with the public sector. True. The public sector. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I guess what about Shanghai would it be the same different, a uh, bit different. Um, one thing I realized when I was, uh, when I, I was in Beijing for about eight months and I was traveling around in China, um, which was actually quite, quite experienced back then. So you, you feel that you have a few parallel worlds going on in Beijing or in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. So in Beijing, you would have the government, um, you have the military who is, who is something of its own, somebody with a military, uh, number plate would, would be able to park anywhere. And, uh, and the, the, the Beijing municipal authority would not be able to find him. Mm -hmm. right. And then you have the state owned enterprises. You have the, um, you have the people who work for MNCs and you have the people who, um, you have the artists and then all these people sort of, uh, uh, 
are forming like parallel societies. That yeah, it was uh, yeah, it was 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 very very different. One, I think one metaphor I use is that I mean, when you go to Beijing, you have uh, so people people like to go to uh, barbecue sk uh, skewers in China now. And young people they hang out with their friends with the, with the, with the barbecue skewer and a beer, right? Um, so in Beijing, you could find places which sell you one skewer for fifty fen, which is like a half um, yuan. Mm. But you also find places which which essentially sell the same thing for for twenty yuan, and both places will be packed. So I mean, it's just, so, just a massive world. Yeah, I mean, you just have different different levels of consumption I and mean, different groups of people who who, who don't who, who don't really hang out with each other. Mm. I suppose that you see that in in, in some cities in Vietnam as well. You have very cheap places, you have very 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 uh, expensive places, um, but people sort of essentially are consuming the same thing. I I, th I think that's developing more. So yeah. so one of my friends, um, her family, she helped launch and run this new coffee chain called Runam Coffee, mm. and that's essentially Vietnamese coffee, mm. but. You know, instead of drinking on the street, it's like a fancy rest, like a fancy cafe, essentially. And mm -hmm. it really just took off. Like I think the timing was right a few mm -hmm. years back when they kind of launched it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, in general, it's very similar to other Southeast Asian countries where it's just very much street food. Mm -hmm. And that's their conception of what food is. And we had actually quite a few good food episodes discussing that dynamic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the challenges of F&B entrepreneur. But um, mm -hmm. I, I think I think to your point, though, it's more like you were operating in these countries and it's a challenge because it's not maybe as homogenous as say Singapore or other places where you used to like maybe very two distinct classes and not as much wide range, I guess. And that's what you see in a big market like China when you're operating, right? In terms of the, the, the way the business is conducted, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's less straightforward and, uh, mm. and, and there are different coasts that we, we interact with different, different, different people. So, so yeah. Is, is that why a lot of foreign companies fail when entering China? Famously, like Rocket Internet or other big con companies in general, why like Walmart just recently failed, right? Or was that in Japan? <laughs> Sorry, uh, that was Japan, I think. <laughs> Walmart failed in Japan, and um, yeah. I, I, I do suppose that I think each big country would have its own set of its own set of like you know, rules, a set of conduct. Customers are different, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for bigger markets would attract more capital than local players of smaller markets, so they are able to evolve better because uh, because because they have a big market and uh, they have more people believing in them. Maybe one better I can use is that uh, I do remember when I was um, when I was doing my exchange in France, I, I, do, I did take a bit of uh, time to travel around Europe and uh, and you felt that uh, I, I remember when I was going to um, Denmark and uh, and Sweden, people speak um, people, people spoke much better English compared to people mm -hmm. in France back then. And um, and initially I was I mean. So I was trying to find out why, right? And uh, and yeah. uh, and and then I realized that uh, at, at that time, many of the TV programs, many of the sort of the, 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 the say US TV series, were yeah. broadcast just in English in those countries, but in, yeah. in France it was dubbed in French. Yes, yes. And yes. Uh, and why it was dubbed in, Fr in French is because in France the market is big enough. I mean, it's, it's worth the effort to to localize. But I guess, yeah, so I guess, but because of a, a cost issue, then, then from, from a education standpoint, English became more widespread because of media being in its own language, which is very interesting. I think, I, I, I think everybody went for English classes. I mean, in China, in my age, I mean, everybody started learning English at the, at the primary four, but, uh, mm. but, but because, so because of the, the mass media and uh, I, I think lots of people of, of my age learned English through watching Friends over and over again. So I know lots of people mm, who, 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 friends. Okay. who did that because I mean, if you if you watch things in in Chinese TV and everything was uh, was stopped. Well, so let's go back to the main point mm. then. Why why do you think these these foreign companies can't succeed in China? I think the same reason why 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 Chinese tech companies Can do not really succeed in Southeast Asia. And I guess that that's your point to exposure, I guess, right? Different contexts and not being able to adapt around that and just trying to apply their own context, which is like the whole point of talking about English in other countries. Um, I think that's the starting point, but, uh, but, but it's, it's much bigger than that, right? I mean, so of course, uh, yeah. it's much more complex than that. You would have issues of, um, for instance, um, when you start a, a business in China and uh, who do you, 
install as the as the, as the, as the general manager or country manager or, or CEO of that, mm. that that business, and 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 that person does that person come from a head headquarters to hire locally, and how much you hire abroad, yeah. And how much trust do you give to that person? And if that person comes and tells you that, oh, this market is very different, I have to act in my own way. Um, how much do you trust him? And if that person yeah. has to interact with uh, the different departments, I mean, if you say, for instance, uh, American e-commerce company going to China, I mean, same as Chinese e-commerce company coming to Southeast Asia, right? Um, mm. And and it, it's, it's not just, I mean, the country manager interacting with the group CEO, it's, um, it's it's logistics, it's payment, it's 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 merchandising, and and, and, yep. and different teams have to work together. So, so, so naturally, you, you're not as fast as a as a team that's that that, that that's that, that's purely local uh, locally based, because they they, they they know they sense things in the market, and also they're able to respond because everyone understands. And just they think your days at ease. Actually, try to explain to the to the to the tech team in Brazil about certain market specifics in, in Vietnam. It's just hard. Yeah. It's just hard. I mean, because people, yeah. people are not there. They can't understand the problem the same way as you do. Yeah, I mean, and, and product as a result moved a lot slower mm. at that global scale, which was very different from Zalora. Like I felt Zalora was so fast, and and like the, even though the product team was based in Portugal, um, I guess by by nature that we were only focused on Southeast Asia, yep. just made things ship a lot faster. Um, yep. We had a very good localized, even though she was Portuguese, she was localized to the markets, mm. being based there, and could understand and translate very well. So I think I think that was a big difference and a big shock, you're right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, is, are there any, any examples in China where there was a successful tech company that's foreign that's doing well? Uh, Microsoft, but Microsoft is different, right? It's, it's, it's a monopoly. Yeah. It's enterprise sales. Yes, correct, correct. And um, uh, I think Uber did relatively well, uh, at least in terms of the return, right? They, they managed to that's true. to merge with Didi at much higher valuation, even though it probably yeah. fell short of the of the ambitions of uh, Travis Kalanick, but still, I think in terms of returning, they did pretty okay. Um, yeah, I mean, even in Southeast Asia, I, I would argue like they're, they're, I mean, like it wasn't tenable, I think mm. if they were going for IPO and profitability, mm. but like the strategy to retain equity and swap equity, well, very smart. Uh, for companies being successful in China, uh, um, Nothing, can give them nothing that comes, nothing that stands out, right? So that's a very interesting point. Of course, cynics and other people argue is because uh, the Chinese government is protectionist, and there's got to be an element of that. But um, you know, I guess it is possible. Like there, there are some brands out there, I bet that that probably could succeed. I guess. I, I feel that the Chinese government is less protectionist than, than these days. Than, than most people think, because um, okay, okay. Imagine how much they they, they gave to Elon Musk. For him to build a business of Tesla in China, that, subsidies that's and everything. A good point. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. And like uh, the first time I went to China was in Guangzhou, and I was so shocked to see so many Tesla charging points everywhere. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And, yeah. And, and strategically, it makes more sense for um, for the Chinese leadership to turn Elon Musk into advocate for closer business ties with China than exactly. shutting him off, right? I mean, so um, if much bigger strategic goals behind it, but of course, I mean. Um, it goes down to to the provincial and local level. They might, I mean, the officials there might not see things as strategic as the central leaders. Yeah, I mean, a common narrative I hear is that if you want to get to a unicorn status, the government has to give you a stamp of approval. Is that true to a degree, or what do you know? I, I think depending on what kind of business you run, right? I mean, if you run a a, um, a sort, of, sort of news business in China, uh, okay, news aggregator. Yes. And of course, that's 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 that's, that's, that's much more sensitive, sensitive. M- much more sensitive yeah. than if you if you're running a e-commerce business. Um, mm-hmm. I, I I don't think Amazon ever had a uh, much sort of um, um, discriminatory treatment from the Chinese government, and uh, I think they they, they 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 were competing with Alibaba on a on, on a fairly fair fair ground. But of course, I mean, for companies like Google and Facebook, um, so so it, it, it's. It, it's naturally more difficult uh, for the government to allow them to to give the same level of information access compared to what they would do in the West. Why 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 is that the the case? What, what is the fear? Or because because it's not reciprocated. Like if mm. I feel if like uh, Baidu or um, the the maps company in China wants to go to the US, they, they could just set up and, and go, mm. right? I, I, I think it's something to do with the, with, with with the complexity of, uh, of of governing that country. Mm. So it, it, it's complex, and um, I think I think recently there, there, there's this um, uh, article, social media post by the um, 
um, by the former foreign minister of Singapore, and he said he was uh, he was in Xinjiang many years ago, and um, and 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 actually it's interesting that he, he wrote that on social media or, or 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 in an article. He was in Xinjiang many years ago, and uh, and he was uh, I think he was riding a horse and realized that she was he was trying to talk to the girl who was sort of helping him, and it, and he realized that the girl didn't speak Mandarin, <laughs> and uh, interesting, and he he said. He said it could be problematic because in a country where all the business was conducted in Mandarin, and uh, and if you don't speak Mandarin, obviously you are going to be disadvantaged. Mm. But uh, if you force her to learn Mandarin, that's that that, that becomes a little bit sort of uh, I don't know. I mean, perceived as culturally insensitive, whatever. So it's uh, it, it's difficult. Is is that wasn't that how that was handled though in in the Cultural Revolution? Is unified under one language, and that's exactly what Singapore did too, right? They killed all the dialects in in Singapore. They killed all the dialects. I mean, you, 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 even China, they tried to kill all the dialects. They, they, but that was too and, big. Uh, they couldn't do it, right? Uh, it was difficult, but uh, I mean, it, means it was just hard to hard to be more enforced. But 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 I do remember when I when I was a kid. Uh, I mean, in my school it was okay, but in certain schools, um, if you speak di dialect, you would be fine. But ah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so, but, but that was also also a practical problem they faced. Um, I read um, a bit of a um, bit of history about the Second World War and where they were fighting against the Japanese and uh, um, literally had regiments of uh, Chinese army coming from different provinces, could it, not able to communicate with each other. <laughs> that's, that's very fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's. I think people. I, that's one thing people don't understand, like how massive and like so like like america it's america is so big that people just don't know anything beyond america and that's how big mm -hmm. it can be so like mm -hmm. often what you're hearing in the media is just media but like the every daily life they might not even understand some of these things you're talking about or can even talk to each mm -hmm. other within the same country mm -hmm. right so it's a lot mm -hmm. more nuanced i think that people give and to a degree it's government to a degree it's not and mm -hmm. sometimes it's just people chasing a sens sensationalist story right it's complex i mean certain issues um Certain issues are not black and white, and yeah, um, yeah. and it's just difficult to, and if it's difficult to appreciate unless you know the you know the context behind it. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so like I, it sounds like your first early experience, six years journalism, and it's kind of like you're uh, running the business in a sense. You're doing everything like a generalist, right? And that sounds mm. like very good prep work for venture building later. So how 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 were you introduced to Rocket Internet and Easy Taxi by I think it was November two thousand thirteen, right? I went to INSEAD. I was a bit bored of uh, of, uh, of being uh, in the media company. Oh, that's right. There was a gap uh, from when you finished Alphabet Media. So you did INSEAD and then you got, mm. jumped into Easy Taxi. Mm. Mm. So I, I, I went to business school because um, the, the primary reason why I left is that I, I felt that there was a, it was a ceiling of what credit media can do. Mm. And as you grow to a certain size, and you sort of ask yourself that I mean, as an organization, do you continue to to push for more media organizations, uh, so, so, so more, more, more media business, or we try to um, leverage the community that you have built to do something else. And that's a debate which, uh, which, which went a bit to the dead end. And I was a bit bored because, because I, after it had grown to a certain extent, uh, extent it, the growth kind of plateaued. So, yeah. so, so it became less interesting. So, 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 so I, I left, I went to business, business school and, um, um, spent a year there when I was graduating at this friend who was a Brazilian guy who was basically living next to me in the next house and he was saying that hey uh, he know he, he, he knows a guy called Rodrigo Sampaio who was uh, <laughs> oh he, he knew he knew Rodrigo yeah he was uh, he was working at, 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 he was working at McKinsey before in Seattle and Rodrigo okay, was his mentor uh, and, uh, uh, and and he said oh yeah they 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 have a business which is coming to Asia do you want to give it a try I mean that's how I got into it and, and to be clear Rodrigo Sampaio was I guess the right hand man for Oliver Samware Rocket Internet for Latin America basically so he yeah, was the MD yeah. for Latin America ran all the ventures yeah. um Okay, so and then what? So he, you said you were interested, in, and and then uh, did you meet Dennis, the CEO of Easy Taxi, back then, or what was happening? Uh, I think I had three calls. I had one with uh, uh, what's his name, Jose Shaliga. Okay, uh, that was the he was the CEO at cool. the time. Very shortly, right? Yeah, and uh, I had a call with Dennis, and then I had a call with June. Ah, because June, yeah, June was the one who kicked off June, Easy Taxi uh, yeah, from episode two. Yes. June was already there, so so yeah, so so. How how was your call with June? What was that like? Uh, it was alright. Um, yeah. 
All right. So he just gave you like uh, no, no surprises or anything. Like a sicko story was that he talked to June the same day he was forced to come in and start working. No, no. I mean, I think at that time I uh, I was um, I was I was just exploring. I was not fixated on this. And, and after I spoke with them, I, I actually went back to China for a surgery. So I disappeared for two months. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, what was your conception of Rocket Internet back then? Like, what did you know about them, and what were you thinking? Uh, not much, actually. So, um, so, but but most of my friends, they said, "Oh, the company has really, really bad uh, reputation." We go to Glassdoor. Glassdoor's already existed by that time, and yeah. if you look at the ratings, so it's one point five, one point eight, two yeah. out of five. So it must be a horrible place. And um, and and to be honest, I mean. I remember for me as well as lots of uh, lots of people fresh out of sort of business school, you, you try to change what you were doing before, but uh, but Very you don't common. have to, yeah. you don't you don't have a fixed idea of what you want to change this to. Interesting. But why, yes. why 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 is that the case? Why why do people why do so many people go into business school without the purpose? Right. I, I would think business school case makes a lot of sense if you know what you're going to get out of it. But it seems like people go in, they come out, they still have no clue when they come out. I I think many people go there to to find out. <laughs> but and then they find out they don't find out anything. Yeah, um, or, or or they find out what they had, um, what they thought w would make sense, did not really make sense. Um, okay, so so there, okay, there's some positive outcome for some people, I guess. Then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's exposure. Um, yeah, it's exposure for you to, to meet with different people, learn about things, and change your perception about the uh, about things. Yeah. Okay, so here's an interesting question because. I think out of our, our network of friends, you, you are probably more famously like this uh, amazing networker with a, a vast networking and, and um, you know, who know a lot of people deeply from all types of industries and, and wakes of life, right? But yeah. a lot of the argument people talk about of going to business school is they would want to go to acquire a network. Uh, do you think this is true or do you feel like no matter what, you would have had the same network because of who you are without business school? I think, I think business school doesn't really change you fundamentally as a person. You sort of... Uh reinforces your your strength and uh it just it, I, I don't think it fundamentals fundament, fundamentally changes you hmm. so essentially so, no yeah so you will see people i mean if you're going to business school and coming out that i mean they don't become transformed but but but, but they become empowered interesting okay yeah hmm. kind of like uh, finding your feet i guess in terms of business and, and reinforcing some concepts right um yep. what what so what were the best parts of rocket internet that surprised you Oh, I do. I think um, I think just um, just 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 bunch of people, young, reckless, and uh, and very, very true. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 trying to build things, trying to break things, and uh, and uh, communications was super straightforward. And uh, you have like interesting metrics to play around with. You have budget to play around with. Um. So so yeah, I think it was fun, and I would I I would imagine that people who were put in positions of rocket say, uh. A country CEO would, would have much more fun than people who are putting who are put at the, at the, at a different role. And I, I feel like there's like a kind of a once in a lifetime kind of thing. Like I, I don't think young people are going to have be empowered by so much uh, funding, so much autonomy, kind of like yeah. how Rock Internet did it, and that, that allowed for huge amounts of growth. I, I can say, right? Uh, yes, but but it also creates this this, this bubble, right? I mean, and, and uh, you probably know that lots of people are trying to replicate that, and uh, after the Rocket experience, and they find it hard. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, what were some of the worst aspects? Do you think then of Rocket Internet? Uh, worst or bad. I think for me, um, you're too focused on whatever you're building. It, 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 I mean, I, I, I remember I sent an email to Jorge Sampaio a few months into the job. I said, what is the strategy? And, uh, and he wrote me back all caps saying that, I mean, let's not waste time on this kind of useless discussion about strategy. Let's focus on execution and stuff. Um, all, all caps. <laughs> so all caps, yes. Yeah, all caps. And, uh, uh... and of, of course, for that, that context it made sense but um but but i mean if you're the person running it um, there's one aspect which was missing which is think about what what do you do does it make sense and if if, if things don't work out uh, and you see this natural tendency of pushing harder you don't see the tendency of saying that okay let's change the strategy let's do that because people are running they're running fast when you when you're running you don't you don't think too much about is there a different path would different path be better 
uh, tun tunnel vision. And well, that's, I think that's exactly where we, we tripped up for Easy Taxi, right? We, we were so focused on taxi as the, the correct business model, especially when the unit economics never made sense, I guess, for Southeast Asia, mm. um, that we completely missed the whole black car thing, which I think the first COO, right? I think he tried to push that, but then he left soon after. So mm. I guess there was no discussion after that. Um, mm. So I think you're right. You know, I think one of the bad aspects is that, um, especially their obsessive operations and execution, Mm. That, that, you know, product suffers and strategy suffers, and especially in the app space that early on in the ecosystem, uh, you needed to get product experience, right? And I think Grab was just a little bit better. They weren't great. And Uber was just amazing, right? So mm. when we competed on that, no one ended up using our product. So I, I definitely think, at least for me, that's where I think Easy Taxi went wrong. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think, what, what do you think we did right though for Easy Taxi then? I think, I, I think operation wise, definitely, uh, definitely would be lots of things and, um, <laughs> I wouldn't say that we did a particularly right, but uh, but 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 the, these are areas that that I learned, and my learnings could be applied moving on. So the way to 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 run operations, to recruit people, I mean to to do marketing, to do PR, basically basically running a team, right? Running a team of yeah, different disciplines, and um, and and you realize that being a general manager is very very different from being a BU manager with a, or, or being a line manager. So it's um, oh yeah yeah very and, different. And, yeah yeah. But from that to, to a real entrepreneur, one thing missing is the strategy. You have to worry about strategy. Correct. You know, yeah. you don't, at Rocky, you don't have to worry about strategy. You don't have to, to, to worry about funding. And you always have option to just quit. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a very good point. Like, uh, the, mm. the reason why I love Zalora, like, they offered me, the uh, you know, like a co-founder MD position for Thailand. But mm. I was looking for that generalist knowledge. And I think you're right. That I got exactly what I was looking for in terms of, working across so many different disciplines and, and pulling a team together. Um, and, and you astutely point out the weaknesses in the rocket context is that you, you don't have developed that strategy muscle and you don't develop, it's because it's given to you and you just execute like hell. Um, yeah, um, and, but, but, but also in a way you can be a little bit more reckless because, uh, because you know that you have option to quit. That's true. Yeah, it's not, mm -hmm. you don't have the, the fiduciary responsibility. Um, mm. But I, you know, that, I think that is the social contract of Rocket. And I, I think mm. if you mm. work there long enough, you would understand it. Whereas people who only work there for a short time, six months, one year, like mm. they, 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 they see it as a bad thing per se, mm. right? But it's just literally, you made that deal, right? So, and yeah. you, get, you get the upside, but you also get the downside, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and what, what are your thoughts of the current state of ride share now? Where, where does it go from here? Especially looking at China, Middle East, US, Europe, Southeast Asia, what, do you, what are your thoughts on the current state of ride share? Um, I think Russia as a so pure play basis model and it's, um, it's, it's not that, that attractive anymore. So, um, un, un, unless you have like sort of a self-driving cars, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I see that, I mean, have you seen the Uber, Uber share price over the last few weeks? I have not checked what, where yeah, was it? It has grown a lot. I think it's now close to 50. Okay. Yeah, close to fifty, and uh, I think a key thing is that it's um it is it's making making very very big moves into uh, food delivery. Mm. I mean, they had a amazing head start already with Uber Eats, right? Like the the, mm. the network effects from the car and combining food plus that network was a great innovation. Um, and in terms of that, do you think that's what everyone copied, investors copied, or like like food seems to be the main obsession now, right? Do you, do you th stemming from this, or do you think it's just individual innovation? I, I do think that uh, that that, that uh, the, the major players are, are sort of looking at each other, see what makes sense, what they, what they can learn from, and uh, this company called Mintuan. Uh, you guys probably know. Um, Mintuan, yeah. Uh, I mean, started as a as a as a as group from copycat, then became the biggest um, food delivery company in China, and uh, for a long time, people, so the investors were were worried about their. Um, unity economics and especially the, the, the huge on-demand delivery infrastructure that was very expensive to 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 establish and maintain and would that yeah. make sense and it was, it was always seen as a drag until this year they started making quarterly profit net mm. profit so, so so suddenly suddenly the whole logic changed right i mean people, people instead of seeing this as something expensive um uh, and people see that as infrastructure that could enable many other things and suddenly you can imagine okay based on this on demand um uh highly efficient uh local delivery infrastructure what else can you build on top of that i mean mm -hmm. with, whether it's grocery whether it's um sort yeah. of super, supermarket or whatever there, there are lots of things you can build on top of that so, so i mean essentially you're what what i'm kind of trying to understand is then you're, you're saying that ride share in itself was always just a trojan horse 
uh, except for the exception of um, autonomous cars, right? If that's pulled off, then then it becomes valuable, right? And it's reflected in share price currently. Mm. But if not, like if you're in the rideshare space, you have to innovate beyond that because rideshare mm. in itself is just not going to do it. Um, and everyone just kind of poured in billions and billions of dollars to build the infrastructure to build on it, right? Mm -hmm. I suppose. I suppose not everyone knows that uh, that that this infrastructure is for something else. It's not just for red share. I mean, just just purely red share. Red share is not that interesting. Yeah. Mm. Um, what are your thoughts around California Proposition Twenty Two? Do you do you know the legislation or no? Uh, roughly, but not in detail. Yeah. Uh, the general the general gist is that so all the companies like Uber, Lyft, uh, DoorDash, Postmates, they're they've put a ton of money to lobby this new piece of legislation where they would be exempt for giving uh, gig, gig workers benefits mm. as employees, right? So mm. bas basically, um, I think they're trying to pass that in California. So what, what are your thoughts around that? Because I know that Asia is always going to be far behind. But like, if this gets passed in California, you know, it's, we will see how different governments around the world also react, right? In terms of, um, you know, how gig economy workers are treated. I, I'm, I'm not very familiar with uh, with the labor dynamics in California uh, of course, or, yeah. or, or generally the, the sort of, um, sort of um, employment trends but um but i suppose that uh, that each country you have to look at things differently right i mean um yeah. you have countries where where we have a large labor force i mean coming from the countryside in the city who have been doing informal jobs and uh, you also have i mean places um where people sort of choose to have um informal jobs for flexibility so i think that has to be evaluated. i mean so for instance in southeast asia i mean the reason why people to choose to 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 be a grab driver or for delivery uh, rider is probably different from the reason why people choose to choose, I mean, choose to become a uh, food delivery rider in Indonesia. So, I don't so know, man. I I, I talk. I mean, like I've talked to rideshare drivers all across Southeast Asia, and mm -hmm. I mean, there are at least some common threads. Like people just love the flexibility. Mm -hmm. They love the no contract, and they love mm -hmm. that they can make more money. It's either that they, they, they're out of a job and they can make money or they can make more money than their other job, right? And I think that's a common thread almost across Southeast Asia for every driver I talk to. I think, um, I, I, I do believe that from a society point of view, I mean, having stable employment is always better than um, than, than doing random jobs. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, a stable income would allow you many things, will allow you to save. I think people who take like red shirt sh 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 more, more, more seriously are probably working that as full time job. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, at least in the case of Malaysia, their, their stance has always been to push regulation, right? So all, mm. all of the e hailing drivers are required to be licensed. They have to pay an annual license. They have to get checked, right? Mm. They have to follow SOPs. Mm. Um, I'm not too sure about other countries in Singapore, but like, uh, if, if that's the case, it feels like this is going to be a part of the cost structure going forward. I, I feel like if more regulation comes, but I'm not as familiar in, in other countries. I think, I think, I think as far as regulation is uh, is concerned, I'm um, I'm less of a fundamentalist, like you know what is right, what is wrong, but I'm mm. sort of more of a pragma pragmatist. And I look at okay, uh, any particular piece of regulation, what's the short term and medium term and long term impact of, of, of on different players impacted by this regulation? I mean, the labor yeah. force. Um, the, the employers, the, the economy in general, and uh, yeah, and and they decide what's right for the country. And uh, I, I don't think there's one size fit, fit, fit all. You're 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 right in that sense, but you know, as a business owner, and if you decide to participate in a gig economy, if the cost structure is too high, you you have to start looking somewhere else, and that destroys maybe a, a viable industry if it wasn't as regulated, right? Yep, 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 yep yeah. Yep. And but, I, but I guess that is the point. Yeah. And also, I, I suppose at different stages of, of the development of the industry, I mean, the regulation probably needs to be adjusted to sort of nudge the industry towards the right direction. But I think in reality, it's quite hard, right? I mean, even if you look at the the, 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 the financial regulation, you see this huge episode with the, what happened to Ant Group, and um, oh, and, yes. and, 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 and 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 people tend to 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 put things in in a simplistic way. So what is right, what is wrong? But 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 how do you balance a sort of um, innovation and uh, and risk risk control so it's um it's not something that you have a fixed answer it's something that, that that's dynamic yeah so mm. so for so for our viewers who don't follow chinese news as much what, what was the gist of what happened with ant financial group oh um the company was going for uh, for ipo then jack Ma made a speech criticizing the regulators and uh the ipo was called off so yeah and that was supposed to be the biggest ipo ever in history 
And then what, what is the effects of that? Do you think businesses in China are now looking somewhere else because of that? They, they didn't realize how much power Beijing had or what, what, what do you think is going to happen going forward for businesses that look to IPO in China? Um, I think, I think people need to, 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 to understand more about what's really, really going behind. And, um, um, it's, um, it's, 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 it's much more complicated than, than what you see on, on the surface. Right. I mean, yeah. um, so you have. So, so, so the main revenue profit of end group comes from these lending products. Yeah. And it's mainly targeted at young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, when young people take a lot of leverage, is that a good thing for the society or is that a bad thing for the society? And uh, it's hard to say. Yes, that's true. And, uh, and, 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 and sometimes, um, I mean, this is something for the regulators to, to, um, to, to, to balance. And sometimes it's not easy um, because I mean, the, 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 the thing about regulators is that uh, if you don't regulate and people saying that, okay, and the companies are reckless, that are creating instability, that are creating risk. And if you regulate too much, you are stifling uh, innovation. So it's, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to, to find a balance. And um, and I think this is something that's, that's, that's always dynamic. Uh, but I think for, for this particular episode in, in China, um, I would suggest you go and read this article by Reuters about the stories behind it. That will give you a picture of what exactly happened. Uh, and on the low down momentum works blog, right? Uh, no, it's, on, it, it, it's a, it's a Reuters article on the, um, a Reuters article. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll link it to the, the description. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. we, we blocked about this as well. So we have our perspectives and then maybe it's a, it's a, it's worth yeah, reading as well. Definitely worth reading the momentum. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of people are, are watching that and, and value the opinion. So mm. the people should definitely check out the Momentum Works Lowdown blog. Mm. Um, so I want to skip ahead. I, I'm going to skip this one section. Let's let's go straight to Momentum Works then. Mm. Um, in, in your view, do you view many Rocket Internet alumni as too risk averse at heart? Or how do you think about that? I think Rocket gives you uh, adrenaline rush. But, but still, I mean, the same as I comment about business schools, he doesn't change you as a person fundamentally so but and, and the type of profile they end up hiring do you think they end up are are the right kind of mindset profile in person because like you said it doesn't change you much as a person but do you think they will be suited for entrepreneurship if you're a rocket alumni on, on average i think on average from appetite point of view you are you you, you i mean it's, it's much harder for you to actually go and work for a corporate let's put it that way that's fair yeah yeah, yeah and but... i guess so and that kind of feeds into the story um you know you finished easy taxi you did a little stint at food panda what was the impetus and the main idea behind starting Momentum Works then, uh, being a Rocket Internet alumni almost five years ago, back in 2016? Uh, I think lots of things were not planned. It just happened. So, and uh, for the better or for the worse, um, it just happened. So when I left Rocket and I was basically consulting for a few friends companies in different places, I was in, I was in the Middle, Middle East briefly and etc. So one thing I, did a lot in 2016 is is to to expand my exposure because I mean back to the point we mentioned right I mean you are you're so focused on your business you're so focused yeah. on your KPIs you don't know what's that what's out there correct and uh, and you, you don't know who are the VCs you don't know what other businesses have been built outside your your sector or your sort of adjacent sectors mm -hmm. and and just um I I think just to spend time just going around checking out different stuff and uh, and yeah I. I remember for like from 2016 for a few or few years, you were just literally flying every month, right? You were to a different country. And I guess this was part of the outreach and learnings, right? You were meeting with friends, VCs, investors, entrepreneurs, founders across the world, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just, just going around to see what was going on. And, um, and also I think spent quite a bit of time sort of back and forth between China and Singapore. I think 2016, I was going back to China almost once every month for a week yeah. or so. So just. So many things happened. So I guess out of this idea, you know, I guess coming from Rocket Internet being a venture builder, having consulting projects, I guess that kind of formed the foundation of what Momentum Works is now, right? Uh, it, it does. It does. Although, I mean, w when I first started, I wanted to build an, an accelerator. So, so you, you thought about Rocket. No, that's and right. You, you think about it, you have this operational experience, building structure, building team, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can, you can sort of provide value by helping others to do that. But I think I dropped that fairly quickly because, um, because you started meeting entrepreneurs, they realized that the real, the real good entrepreneurs do not need your help. 
That's, you know, that's a very good point because I, I was listening to a podcast with Michael Siebel, mm. the, the CEO of Y Combinator. And he says the best way to get into Y Combinator is that you're going you're gonna to succeed no matter what, with or without Y Combinator. And those I are mean, the people they accept, right? So, I mean, the same, the same thing you say about business schools, right? I mean, why do you go to a business school? You go to business school for the, for the reputation, for the alumni network. Yeah. And for the access. Yeah. And, uh, and, but it doesn't change you fundamentally. I mean, if you, so, so I mean, essentially what you're saying is like, you felt you couldn't add value. Like just, so you're telling me like, if you're a founder, who's not going to succeed, you can't, I mean, you got to give people time to grow and learn. Right. So you're saying so, an accelerator couldn't make founders successful. No, I'm saying, I think the only accelerator that's successful is why coming in and running. don't have anybody else. That There's is. some other ones. Um, o only a, f only a few, like less than five for sure. Yeah. Very, very few. And, uh, and this is something I realized, right? I mean, you succeed as a, as a <clears throat> accelerator, not because you're great. I mean, just because that you are at the right time with the right people and you're better than everybody else with there at the same time. I, I mean, you're, you're hitting uh, the heart of, you know, are, are you a good investor or not? Or was it just because of timing, right? Like mm -hmm. that's a, that's a very sticky topic. And uh, the problem is because that, you know, venture return takes multi-decade years to, to unfold. Yeah. You might, be, you might just be in a bull run and you just got right timing instead of you thinking maybe you're a very good investor. You, you can still do, do stupid things when you're in a bull run, right? But of course, I mean, going with the wave is much easier than going against the wave. But to be fair, like, you know, when, when you're going against the wave and everything is down, if you can make it happen, then I guess that's, that means you have probably some type of edge, right? Uh, or it could also mean that the direction of the wind changed. And then it's just timing. Yeah, that's another way of looking at it. Yeah, perfect. Um, and I, I guess that's the existential problem of being an investor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do, do, speaking of investors, uh, you went to China and you raised money for Momentum Works. Do you want to talk about the the investor behind that, or? Um, I would not name uh, the person because uh, okay. he, he wants to remain low, a low profile. But uh, but the story is that I I, I met him at, at a conference and. Um, um, yeah, and, and he was asking me, do I need money? And uh, I didn't have a fixed idea about how I wanted to run it, but uh, but it took the money anyway. So, so it's uh, it's a small sum, but uh, but very enough to get things started. In the end, uh, was that the right move? Uh, should you have had a better idea, a prototype, an MVP, and then taking the money, or what are your thoughts around raising money early? Um, I think that case is specific because it was it was for an individual who didn't want anything. He didn't want to board seat or whatever. So it's it's most of the pay I trust that as a person and, uh, and mm. take some money. You, you might make something out of this, but, uh, but there's also a high chance that, uh, that this money is going to waste. So, so, so he's willing to a lottery ticket essentially. Yeah. That, yeah. So, so, and of course, for some people that, uh, the ticket can be, can be, can be a lot of money and uh, they, they, it's okay. So, and, uh, I mean, he's a pretty high profile guy in China. He's still on the cap table. I'm assuming. Yes, he is. Okay. So he's, so, so he could still at least be an advisor if needed, if things work out. Um, mm. To me, what was most impressive, though, I think across five years at the peak, you know, your team size was what, over 50 people mm -hmm. and you have been able to feed people. And I, and I think what people don't understand is what entrepreneurship is like month to month. You were never really sure if you're going to be able to pay all these people. Right. Yeah. Um, and and essentially you, you were doing multiple things for this big team across different business segments. So you had multiple business models running at the same time. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is something that. Uh... I don't know. I mean, people always tell you to focus. Yes, correct. And, uh, but, but what happens if you don't know what the right focus is? So you go wide. You could diversify it in a way. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, in a sense, it was kind of like a learning journey too, right? So you, you kind of started out and at least you had some idea where you could make money because you were paying for 50 people. That's a big payroll, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, for not having a clear idea and you were still be, you were still able to make money on a consistent basis. And I think, you know, like you said, the learnings and trying to figure out what to do, uh, was really good eventually because, you know, after you try enough, you have enough data, you can, fo then you kind of know where you want to focus on. Yep. Uh, and, and, and I think, I think when I was looking at the, the early days of Alibaba and the lots of things that, that, that they were doing were not sort of, sort of, uh, part of the strategy that, that they were, they were the greenest, uh, pursue is something that they stumbled upon and they said, okay, this makes sense. Let's put more resources in into that yeah. so um so f of course i mean if you, if you know what's the right thing and uh, if that thing turns out to be right i mean having a razor sharp focus makes lots of sense uh we when you are not so certain um 
I mean, it's, it's just uh, just uh, whether, whether whether you go all in with one stock or you you want to have a portfolio. Correct. Yeah. And I guess you, you kind of went the you kind of you went in the mindset with trying to go broad and diversify, and then hopefully mm -hmm. find that value to focus, right? Yeah. Would you advise young founders who want to focus on like you know it's not a pain point, it's not coming internally, but they want to chase an idea that they think is right? Would you would you advocate the approach you did, or would you not advocate that approach? I think it depends on what kind of uh, market environment you are in, right? I mean, yeah. it's, um, you somehow feel that in Southeast Asia, there's there's much more tolerance about companies, right? I mean, you have companies which sort of know that are not going to make it, but they can still survive for two years before finally shutting down, like zombies almost. Yeah. And because I, I, I can really plug it into the ecosystem in China and see a lot of what's going on there. And uh, people there do not have that, that patience. I mean, mm -hmm. founders starting a new project, and quite often, like after four or six months, they said, okay, this, I mean, it's almost like rocket, right? I mean, okay, this project's not going to be out, let's do something yeah. else. Yeah. Uh, which, which now people come to see as being okay. I mean, it's okay to fail. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and because circumstances and everything, so, so success depends on lots of things. And as long as we still trust that person as, a, as capable and responsible and, uh, and, and, I do see people who, who fail like three or four projects over two years. And then the last one would sort of Hit on, hit on something and then grow big. Um, so let, let's be specific. Mm. Should should they kind of follow your approach where you have one holdings company, but you try multiple business models mm. or should they do it as a serial entrepreneur where they might fail in succession instead? I think it depends. I think it depends. So depends on the context. So, 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 so you, if you're able to quickly try out different, different business models and, uh, and why not? Right. I mean, just, yeah. just focus all your attention on something. After two months, it doesn't work. Change or something else. Uh, I mean, that, that's perfectly possible. I mean, it depends who you are working with, who who funds you, and uh, what kind of tolerance of risk and uh, and mm -hmm. yeah, the person has. Um, for me, I think it was specific because I didn't really have a uh, have a, have have a particular sort of um, venture idea that I was very passionate about at the time. So yeah, so so, so that's why I went to the approach of so sort of. Um, spread a bit wide, then, 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 and especially having the blog and stuff, so so that you have lots of inbound uh, conversations going on. So so that helps you understand the ecosystem better, and and potentially if you choose to focus on something that uh, that at least you know that okay, this is a more informed decision. It's not purely based based on on, on, on passion or or based on somebody telling you that this is a good market to to, to go into. Yeah, mm. I mean, like I think it's a very apt. Uh, comparison to marketing strategy mm. so like when you're starting your first company like and then you, you start executing you know you have a good product and you want to start distributing mm. it right uh you're not going to know what is the best channel with the highest roi until you go very wide first right you got to pick as many i mean like you like when you first start marketing you shouldn't do everything because it's probably nothing's gonna be good but you have to go wide enough where you find the right channel at least where you get a good enough return to start growing the you know the traction and the product market fit and growing to users right so mm. in, in that kind of sense it's, it's very similar to how you might approach marketing early stage i guess mm -hmm. so like also I, I don't know if you want to open up about this and you could tell me yes or no but you know by having a very wide focus having a massive team it came at a cost right a personal cost and how it made you feel of, um, and it was very stressful, right? Do you want to talk about that experience or no? Um, put it that way. So when you are a founder, you employ people, you convince people to join you, and um, and, and you, you sell a dream to people and people who otherwise have, a, I don't know, a better job, more comfortable job, at, mm -hmm. and especially people who give up their corporate jobs to to, to, to join something and, um, and the mistakes you you make right the mistakes you make uh, it comes at at the, at the personal cost of those individuals and some yeah. and sometimes it's their fault sometimes it's not i mean but you can never say it's entirely whose fault right and it's circumstances and uh, and temper whatever so you you almost always end up like you no know, turning some friends into non friends yeah yeah it's um and and, and this is something i never understood when uh, i think my uncle was telling me when i was in high school because at, at some point i was so, so bored of the dorm so i went to stay with my uncle for for a few weeks and uh yeah. and uh and he was telling me that uh, try not to work with your friends on joint business ideas mm. uh, and um and i sort of didn't really appreciate that back then but now i appreciate that much more well, I, I have the counter argument to that is that 
I think most people are not ready of the mindset to get to those very uncomfortable spaces and conversations, or they don't have the tools or uh, mental models to how to approach those situations. So of course, if you don't have, if you're not ready to kind of em embrace those harder aspects, if you do do it, it, it might end up very messy. I, um, but I, I do think it is possible. I mean, a, a perfect example is you're working with your wife, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I do agree with you. So, um, so, so I think a lot of that has, um, has something to do with, we, we get into something. Um, I think both parties tend to think about this thing in, in a very rosy way and it's surely good. Oh, of course. Surely going to work. And, 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 and ro ro rosy and different though, different types of rosy. And, and I do think that if you can be a little bit more upfront, think about all the things, why you could fail and how you could fail and, uh, and have, have all, all those things sort of prepared, at least mentally, you'll you make things much easier. Well, I also think it's just a function of communication. Like, I, I think the reason why young people will not need, I mean, like, I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, it serves them to be a little bit naive because if not, you would never try it. Yeah. If they only focus on a cynical, uh, you know, depending how risk averse they are, you know, they might not mm. have even attempted the idea and then maybe timing and luck might not have happened. Right? Mm -hmm. So. It could, it could, it's a kind of like a balance of both, I guess, you know, like having, having those thoughts is important. And, but I think the more important bridge is the communication about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like, for me, my last uh, marketplace venture, you know, I, for me, it came at the cost of the wrong foundation. It came at the cost of, I, it's, I wouldn't say it's very crippling or bad or, you know, the, the worst kind, but I, it was some form of depression. Mm. right? And it, it just was very heavy when things don't work out the way it is after working three years and be believing in an idea, mm. uh, but it's just not set up right. And then, um, I don't know. Did, did you feel any depression too? And if so, like, how did you work through it and get past it? Sometimes you do. You do feel that uh, that at the moments that, that uh, you feel that the whole world is is going against you, and um, and you feel that the perfect storm storm is coming to you. Like everything you do is wrong, and 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 every every external factor cons sort of conspires against you together. So, so you do feel that. Um, yeah. But. Again, just like when you are investing in stock market, right? I mean, we see the first big dip, you get really sort of uh, anxious, nervous, stressed, or whatever. Yeah. But when you see it again, it's like, okay. I've seen it before. Yeah, that's true. So essentially, what it's experience, time. Um... I mean, it's, it's almost like we see a major challenge, and you you want to feel bad about it, and your friends are going to, to try to get you out of it, but. Un unless it kills you, otherwise you will be out of it. And, uh, and, and when you see something similar, you know how to deal with it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if, if it's not something clinical or something bad, I think time, uh, maybe space away from it, uh, talking to other people, getting support, you know, I think trying new experiences will definitely help pulling you out. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, that's what happened. Momentum works. You guys were really big two, three years in mm -hmm. 50 people. Mm -hmm. And you had to, you know, kind of folk, you finally found value where things might have a glimpse of really being big potential and you kind of had to scale back and refocus, right? Um, I would say that it happened uh, a few times, like, uh, you know, ups and downs and, uh, and, and, and you made a bet into something that, that, that it works or it doesn't work and uh, you have to make decisions, right? And if it mm -hmm. doesn't work, you have to repurpose the people working on this project or, or let some people go or, or have that difficult, uh, difficult uh, discussion with the, uh, with the investors who put money with that specific project. So yeah, really tough, really yeah, tough. That, um, yeah. Okay. So the last topic I want to talk about is maybe your network, right? So, and I, I think, you know, your network has been a huge asset to momentum works. Mm -hmm. um, you have been able to build great relationships across countries, across industries and a huge range of people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a part of the challenge was learning to figure out how to reap value from it, build business models around that. Is that correct? Uh, you, you, in a way is that, uh, I mean, you spend lots of time sort of, um, sort of talking to people, helping people yeah. and learn, try, trying to learn from people and uh, also sort of trying to share with people what you have done. Uh, and, uh, and what's the value of that? Because, um, because you, you can easily spend lots of time on it. So what you're saying is you have to be doing something. You have to be solving some problem and then only you can reach out to someone, right? I mean, there has to be some value, right? I mean, you, I mean, either emotionally or practically that, uh, that, that the person you interact with, I mean, I mean, they benefit from this relationship. So, so let's say you start a new idea, a new venture, you have something of value. Mm. 
uh, how, how do you go about approaching someone to to get them interested to talk to you? Because most of the time you're just meeting up to talk with people, and you know people don't advise that unless there's really something tangible for both sides, right? But it seems that to me like you're always meeting up and talking with someone, and you end up becoming friends, which then then, then it becomes a lot easier because it doesn't always have to be about a mutual exchange, right? Because sometimes you don't know, right? And contacts you make or sort of a knowledge that you acquire, I and mean, it might not be immediately useful. Um, and and then if you uh, a few years later, when you were trying to do something, say, okay, okay, I should know this person who can help me on that. I, Sorry, I have but... multiple experiences of, um, of of us trying to assess something, then should realize, hey, did, uh, hey did this person I know will be an expert on this, and that person can give me mm -hmm. a very, very quick um, lowdown of, about this, and that, that's going to help me make a bit better decision. And I suppose, I mean, something similar is that uh, we are running a team, we don't have a, a position available do you keep recruiting do you keep interviewing people mm. and uh, i mean that, that that's a lot of what, that's one thing founders uh, really don't get young founders but not understand is that a huge portion of your time early on should always like in a sense for you it's like uh, just reaching out and building a network but it, at the same time it could also be used as a recruiting pipeline right i actually don't reach out as much nowadays it's, it's basically people reaching reach out to me so that that that, 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 that. <laughs> you, you cre you've created a platform where you got inbound so that's great i mean the the, the that sometimes can be a burden, right? I mean, if, if someone asks you for That's help true. and you, you need to, to say no because uh, it's, it's beyond my capability or I don't have the time for that, et cetera, et cetera. But, but having that kind of um, breadth of things that, that allows you to see different things and meet different people, um, quite often change your percep um, um, perception when we deal with problems. Uh, and I mean, as long as, true. as long as it doesn't become your full-time job, right? I mean, it's, it, it's something that's on top of, of what you are doing and you spend some extra time on it. So the, the, the way I view it is that um, earlier on in your career, you invested an inordinate amount of time, especially after Rocket, to kind of reach out, learn, uh, solve problems, and then, and then kind of build those connections. And then, you know, if you do that enough early on, then it can pay dividends later. Because yeah. I guess these days, what percentage of time do you still spend reaching out and meeting people? Oh. Less than half. Less than half. Well, that's still a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's probably a lot more than I expected. Than you said, because you said you're barely mm -hmm. doing that these days. But uh, I yeah. guess I guess if people want to build a powerful network, you have to put the work in. Uh, you have mm. to create something of value. You have to, you know, it's it's a matter of just trying out, trying it out and reaching out. And then, you know, you're not sure if it will pay off or not, but it's, it's, I guess it's about building that relationship. And then I think, you know, later on the dividends will come, right? Yep, yep, yep. And, uh, and also I think sometimes we don't put, um, um, we, 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 we don't, we, we do not try to, to measure everything. Of course, of course. Come a little bit more, na more naturally. And, um, yeah. and, and it's, it's easy for you to, to see clarity. Yeah. We're not obsessed with, uh, with just that KPI that you need to pursue. That's a good point. It's a good point. You always have to look more broadly and, and see the things that, that may pay off later and far further down, not, not always immediately. Um, for, for the last question then, uh, what, what, what do you think, like, in today, what is the most absolute imperative of what founders, entrepreneurs, investors should be focusing on in the Asia region that will have a great impact for the, the near-term future? It's a big topic. I mean, if you look at Southeast Asia, it's very different from China, it's very different from India. And uh, if you consider Middle East as part of Asia, it's also different, right? So... <laughs> It's a good point. Um, let's let's pick one country or one region then that you think that's most interesting. I think the I, I think just where we are, that like Southeast Asia, right? I yeah. Mean, you, so last, I mean, last few years, you see lots of like, entrepreneur uh, activity going on, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and quite often the infrastructure was not ready, and um, but now you have the infrastructure which is more or less ready for that. Yeah. Um, for lots of things, and I I, I do believe that the, the, the lots of things which can be built, there's still lots of problems to be solved. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I believe that there are opportunities, um, there are obviously an enormous amount of challenges, right? I mean, yeah. finding the right people could be very challenging, but, uh, so, so in terms but, of, so in terms of supply and demand, I think what I'm understanding, it's probably better to be a builder and a founder at this point in time. I think it's definitely easier to be a founder than being an investor. Mm. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think at this point in time, Southeast Asia is very exciting. I think, you know. What we've mm -hmm. done for the past 10 years have built this uh, big foundation and infrastructure uh, yeah. across all our networks. And, and you're right. I think the opportunity now is just getting more and more interesting where we start to mature. And uh, it's a good time to be a founder, essentially, is, is the answer, right? Mm -hmm. I do believe that, uh, that, that, that for young people, I mean, you should always put yourself in, in a situation where there's growth, right? I mean, either growth of the sector, 
the growth of the of the company that you, you're working or your company you are you, you are you are starting or, or, or growth of the economy in general yeah okay so uh, the last thing then is you know uh, is there anything you want to plug or anything you want to tell us that momentum works is working on and then and how can people reach out to you if they're interested in connecting with you oops um yeah i think i think one thing during COVID uh is that that forced us to slow down to, to, to think about many different things that we have done and what makes sense what doesn't make sense i mean how do we communicate to people what we do right i mean previously yeah. it's always people coming to us saying hey can you do this Ah, oh, we can. Oh, we can't. Or maybe we can. Yeah. So, um, so, so, so now I think we get the we get quite a bit of a clarity. So, um, so we're still building. Um, and um, so, so, so I, I mean, I, mean, I, I think I will always have like one which at hand that 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 that, that, that I'm, I'm putting my, my my time and attention on. So, uh, from a moment of works point of view, so, so I mean, we do content. That's our blog. Just check it out. I and mean, the Loda English and. Uh, What's the and website? We have a, it's tld.momentum.asia. Okay, TLD, TLD stands for the yeah. lowdown. TLD.momentum.asia. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. And and we also uh, start, uh, started like, like a research team to put all these these disparate pieces of information together to try to make sense. So they have come out with a few reports this year. I mean, we, um, there's a price tag for, for some reports, but but the real, the, the, the real intention is not to become a research house. It's, it's just to, I mean, first help us, I mean, have a better understanding about the market, and 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 second, like propagate this message um, to help people uh, look at, at at the different parts of this market as it is, I and mean, not too rosy, not too pessimistic. I mean, what exactly is this market? Mm -hmm. What's the connection between different factors, and how can you? Make you make decisions that will that will you will not regret like in, like a few years later saying that hey I, I wish I knew this thing about this market right yeah 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 so what what else could people connect connect to you for that would be a value for momentum works and for them mm, um, um, we are uh, we are building a uh, community app where um, where, where people can sort of sort of constantly share um, share gossips share share information and ask questions and stuff and uh, so, so we've been running a few um, WeChat and WhatsApp groups um, as a hobby, and they've, uh, they've grown quite big. There's some really, really good interactions, and uh, and uh, and people find value in it. Sort of um, getting the questions on, answered and um, and finding the right contacts and stuff. <laughs> we just feel that um, that uh, it's time for us to to maybe do it a little bit more properly because um, because there's still lots of limitations with the WhatsApp and WeChat. But of course, that's a, a experiment yeah of course yeah so essentially check out the community app which is what's the key, what's the app called uh impulso which is uh, the spanish uh name for momentum okay One. impulso i-m-p-u-l-s-o yes impulso. uh it's still been tested but uh, we expect to to um to have that ready for public release by end of the year so so, so the idea is that i mean we will we, we, verify whoever who joins the, the platform yeah. that once they join they can they can choose to be anonymous i i can guarantee uh, i can vouch for the quality of the the, the learnings in the network you know the, the group is super active uh, I, I wish i could be more i should be more active on there as well but uh the, like it's yeah. you know the, the latest news the latest uh, ideas of founders investors and entrepreneurs literally across all the countries from china to all the way down to indonesia everywhere in, in southeast asia um, so definitely, I think you should join a community. Um, I guess, are, are you looking for investors or investment or anything like this? Uh, we are planning some venture and, uh, and I think when time is right, we'll probably start looking for, for investors. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think, I think over the years we've learned that, uh, that we, we do ventures, I mean, timing is super important. Mm, yes. And quite often you don't want to be the, you don't want to be the, the first mover that spends all the effort to educate the market without being able to occupy the market. Which means you need to raise a crazy amount of money. And if you can't do that, you probably just help someone else educate the market. Yeah, um, yeah. put that way, if you can't sustain your momentum, then, 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 then you will see others leapfrog. Yes, because you, you've helped validate and get the early cohort, and then they have the resources to take over, right? You have, you have so many examples here <laughs> in Southeast Asia. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I think that's a great place to end. Thank you for your time today, Jangan, and I hope you enjoyed the experience. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Thanks, Alex. All right. We'll see. All right. Thank you. Hey, listeners. Thanks for listening to another episode of EOA. If you enjoyed this content, please rate and review on all your app stores and share it with your friends and family. All the engagement and sharing helps us a lot. 
feel free to contact me at alex uh, at entrepreneursofasia.com to give some direct feedback. What have I learned this episode? If you listen very closely, the theme of going off tangents and being extremely pragmatic have served Jangan well along his journey of entrepreneurship. What can be seen as a weakness can be honed and mastered into a strength if one is mindful of it. I also learned that China is a massively complex beast and it's very hard to have a one-dimensional view without considering the full ecosystem and its stakeholders. Just like a good journalist or entrepreneur, always consider the other viewpoints and data before coming to conclusions. Even though things may not be clear, you can still find a path just like how Zhang Gan did in Founding Momentum Works. While it's contrary to some advice, people will always ask you to focus first and find real pain points, Zhang Gan has shown a different path of going wide and then later discovering the focus along the journey. I think not many can pull this off and survive and thrive for as long as Momentum Works has in this kind of method, but the older I get, the more you realize there are many types of paths to success. See you guys back here for next week's episode. EOA out.